Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Larcy, and I'm a grateful member of al Thank you, Owen, for the invitation to get to be here, and, um, and I want to thank Dave. Um, He's a pretty much amazing guy. I am just so grateful to have his friendship and uh, and to be as close to him as I am. Um, he's uh, he's gotten a lot better because he's known me. That's what I always want to tell him. But I will tell you what I've learned from Dave. You know, and I've learned about kindness from Dave. I've learned we don't throw people away. Everybody has value, whether we can see it or not. And I've learned from Dave that there's room for everybody here if we just make room for them. You know, and I'm a better person for knowing that. Uh, so I love you, Dave, and thank you so much for doing this with me tonight. Um, anyway, um, I am a very grateful member of Al-Anon. Um, I never thought I would ever say that. Uh, I just certainly didn't come into Al-Anon wanting to be grateful. Um, but I, but today I am an especially grateful member. Uh, this year marks my 40th year in Al-Anon. I celebrated 40 years in June, and. Uh, and I tell you, boy, I always tell people, if I came into Allen on that day and they would have said, Lars Sr., you're going to be here for 40 years, I would have run out that door screaming bloody murder because I had no intention of participating, being. I didn't want my life to change. I just wanted everybody to be quiet. That, that was my big goal in life. That's all I wanted at that particular time. Um, I grew up in an alcoholic home. I didn't know it was an alcoholic home. It's not like you're born and you get a brochure and it says, hey, your dad's an alcoholic and this is going to explain a lot of stuff. Um, you know, I just, my dad just drank every day. So my conception of dads are that dads get drunk every day. That's just what they do. You know, and my dad was, uh, he was a violent guy too. Not as violent as what uh, Dave grew up with, but, you know, my dad did beat us and, you know, and he did, uh, and he made us feel bad about being girls and, just all the garbage, the goop that goes along, you know, but I know today that my dad did all of that when he was drunk and, uh, but my dad was always drunk to my knowledge. I mean, he just always seemed like he was to me. I don't have too many memories of him not being drunk. And, um, and so consequently I grew up in a, just hardly waiting till, till I was old enough to get the heck out of that house. And I had a list about what my life was going to be like, and I was going to marry somebody who was going to love me because, um, in my house, between my mom and my dad, you could cut the hate with a knife. And uh, and I knew that's what I didn't want. You know, so I was going to marry somebody who loved me. We were going to have nothing but girl children because my dad hated having girls. And uh, and uh, and this person wasn't going to drink, number one on my list, because I know at this point, you know, that my dad's an alcoholic. I know that he's a drunk. I don't even think that I know he's an alcoholic. I just know he's a drunk and he's a mean drunk. And I'm not going to have that when I get out of there. My life is going to be different. And um I know with all the smarts that a 17 year old has and, you know, and I was 17 when I met my husband, um, I should have known there was something wrong with him because my dad liked him right away and that had like never ever happened before but, um, but we went out on this date and I remember he stopped at a liquor store and he'd asked me what I wanted to drink and, uh, and uh, my initial reaction to him is, you know, is, well, I'm 17 years old. And, you know, and I proceeded to tell him the drinking laws in the state of California, because obviously he did not know that I was an underage minor and it was against the law to drink, you know. And so I proceeded to tell him that. And I know he heard today what he still hears when he doesn't want to hear what I said. He heard blah, 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 because he went in and got a gallon of Red Mountain wine, if nothing else, to impress me with his wine knowledge, because I don't know nothing about nothing about drinking. And I remember going over to his house and uh, we were with this other couple and we played a game that's called Pass Out. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it or not, but it is a legitimate board game. It has rules. I read them. And uh, and so and, and the object of this Pass Out game is, is to drink. Now, I don't drink because it's against the law to drink, but I have another rule that's even more important than any other rule I have. And that's I must win every game I play. You know, that's just that competitive thing that's been instilled in me since the day I was born. My dad was a uh, master sergeant in the army. I mean, you will be victorious. You will win under any circumstances, whatever it is you have to do, you will come out on top. And that's my army training, you know, and even still today, I have to be very, very careful of it. Because though in many ways it has served me well, 
You know, I'm telling you, when you're trying to beat your little three-year-old granddaughter, it shoots and ladders. It does not look good, okay? I don't care how you try and make that look good. There's no way you're going to come out looking good with that kind of a attitude going on. So, um, but at any rate, uh, you know, so I drank a half a glass of this god-awful wine so I could win this ridiculously stupid game, and I did. But I'll tell you, you know, and then, you know, guess who drank the rest of the wine? And guess who's pretty intoxicated at this point? You know, and like I've told you, you know, I've got my dreams about what my life is going to be like. And it's not going to include anybody that's drinking. And anybody that drinks a lot and gets drunk is going to be out. But I will tell you what I remember about that day to this. And that's just what a great time I had. How much I enjoyed being with him. How funny he was. How he made me feel good about who I was. You know, and I can tell you in my whole 17 year life career at that point, I never, ever felt that way. Nobody had ever made me feel that way. I'd never felt like I was good enough or I was appreciated or that, you know, that I was worth uh, kissing or, you know, whatever, you know, uh, just being made to feel good about who you were. And um, and so this is where, you know, it, as as an Al-Anon, I will stand toe to toe with any alcoholic when it comes to rationalization and justification of how I wanted to go down. And, uh, and it wasn't hard for me to do. Um, I'm very fond of thinking stuff up. I share all the time that I just think crap up all the time. It's floating in the universe lands here and becomes fact for me. And I act upon it because I grew up in a house where you don't get any facts. You got to figure things out on your own. And, and, and so I just think stuff up. I, I still, to this day, have to be very, very careful with that. You know, and what I thought of that day, you know, was, is just, you know, was brilliant as far as I was concerned, because I had to justify why I really wanted to go out with this guy again with all the drinking that he was doing that evening. You know, and I came up with, you know, see, where my dad's a drinker, when my dad's drinking, he wants to hit you and yell at you, make you feel bad about who you are. You know, when, when my husband's drinking, he wants to hug you and kiss you and tell you how pretty you are. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can work with that, okay? Because that has the potential that only we can see in these alcoholic people is who they could be if they would only just do what we told them to do, you know? And so pretty exclusively from that point on, I dated Butch. It wasn't easy for me to date Butch because he couldn't remember my name, but you can't let a little weenie thing like that, you know, stop you from going out with an alcoholic. You know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, he knows my name pretty well now, but he didn't in the beginning. He would call me up all the time. He called me Lucerne, Lorraine, all kinds of, you know, whatever. And and this is a name story. And I always like to share this because it's about a healing thing with my dad, because um, I was very angry towards my dad for a very, very long time, even into Al-Anon. And um and I had to do a lot of work about that and a lot of resentment. And to me, it was all self-justified. You know, this is what he deserved because this is what he did. And, and I'm so grateful for the forgiveness that we learn in Al-Anon. You know, it says in the uh, Al-Anon, how Al-Anon works books. There's a beautiful, you know, couple pages in there on forgiveness. But the line that's, that slapped me between the eyes is, you know, forgiveness is no favor. We do it for nobody but ourselves. And I always thought if I forgave my dad, I was letting him off the hook and I wasn't going to let him off the hook because it wasn't right. But um, anyway, I did a lot of work about that with my sponsor. And that's a whole nother half an hour story that I'm not going to go into. But but I've done all this forgiveness stuff with my dad. And um, and now fast forward. I'm in Allen on a while. And uh, and I got curious about my name. You know, my dad named me Larsine. This is the story he would always tell me when I was a little kid. You know, the night you were born, you know, you broke my heart because you were supposed to be a boy. There was no girl name picked out. My name was supposed to be Lawrence Edmund Wells Jr. That's it. There was no other alternative available. And then when I was a girl, you know, it was devastating to my dad. But he told me, but because you were my firstborn child, he goes, I named you Larsine, which is the name of a town in Scotland. And uh, and he's always told me that I should always be really proud of it. And I always have been because I've been told that story and told to be proud of it ever since I can remember, you know, and now fast forward, you know, my dad has now since died. Um, he died at 55, you know, the disease that they talk about in our, or the death that they talk about in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, totaling sanity and death. And uh, but again, I'm in Allen on a while. I've done the forgiveness thing, you know, so I get curious. So um, I went to the library back then before Google computers, you had to go to the library for information. I go to the library to look up Larsine Scotland and I can find nothing you know, but it's a little library. So I went to the reference librarian and said, you know, can you look this up for me? It's supposed to be the name of a town in Scotland. And she says, okay, well, tell me what you know, the name of a town in Scotland, only information I have. And she says, well, I'll see, you know, we'll send it downtown LA, see, we'll see what they come back with. 
She says, come back in two weeks. And I remember coming back in two weeks and I remember her handing me this manila envelope and I pulled out this piece of paper and just across the top, it said, no such place as Larsine, Scotland. And I had been through this big freaking forgiveness exercise, you know, in Al-Anon, you know, about letting my dad off the hook, but here he is stabbing me from the grave, you know, and, and again, whenever I get distraught or upset or whatever, you know, my first inclination is Al-Anon doesn't work. This is all a lie, you know, with everything. But again, thinking landing here, it's just because I get hurt, you know, and still being hurt is really, really difficult for me. And, uh, and I'm here to tell you, you know, my MO that I learned growing up in an alcoholic home is it's better that you see me angry than you see me hurt. You know, so I always cover up however I'm feeling with being really, really angry. And I was really, really angry because I was really, really hurt. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, the story goes on, you know, that we have a really good friend in AA. He goes golfing in Scotland all the time. And he said, you know, when he found out about it, he goes, you know, Larsine, maybe, you know, Larsine's just, you know, uh, maybe it was a, a long time ago. Scotland's a really, you know, it's an old country. Maybe there was Larsine Scotland like hundreds or thousands of years ago. Let me go check with my friends in Scotland. He goes to Scotland. He comes back two weeks later. No one has ever heard of Larsine Scotland. You know, now I'm going to change my name. Bite me, dad. Okay. I am pissed off. And I happened to be at my husband's big AA meeting one night. And this friend of ours in AA who since passed away walked up to me. And he goes, Larsine, you're not going to believe this, but I found out that Larsine is a Scottish word. I was like, oh, my God, you are kidding me. He goes, no, it is Scottish. For father was drunk when daughter was born, so daughter got a weird name. Now, I know that that wasn't true. I knew it wasn't true the moment that he said that to me. But I will tell you what he, what he went on to say to me is, Larsine, you know, I don't know. Um, if your dad was drunk, if he wrote it down wrong, if he's just misspelled it, mispronounced it, I have no idea. He goes, but I'm here to tell you I'm alcoholic like your dad's alcoholic. You know, and I believe that when he named you Larsine, he believed it was the name of a town in Scotland. And just because it's not wrapped the way that you want it to be or doesn't look the way that you think it should look, does it really make it any less of a gift? You know, and here I am in Al-Anon, you know, but left to my own devices, I'll change my name. You know, how important it is, you know, that we that we have each other as Dave is so much talked about, you know, on my own, I'm not going to figure it out. I am not. I mean, and if I do, it's only going to be a bad ending, you know, but again, the attitude is everything here. Absolutely positively. And uh, because I never looked at it that way, you know, and it's not like you told me that and I bought it hook, line and sinker. That's not what happened. But I went home that night, you know, and I thought about it. You know, and as mean as my dad could be, I just really couldn't believe that he would go to all that trouble, all that stuff, you know, so that I would find out years after he was dead that my name wasn't the name of a town in Scotland. I don't believe that one bit, you know, and uh, and how grateful I am, you know, because, again, when I'm living in the anger boy and that self-justified anger, which I always say is just as deadly to the Al-Anon as the first drink is to the alcoholic, you know, that's the craziness. And now I got Larsine on my license plate. Um uh, seven letters, it fits there perfectly. And a few years back, my husband got me license plate holders that say it's the name of a town in Scotland. You know, and uh, so far, I've had two total strangers come up to me and tell me they've been there. I mean, you cannot make this stuff up. This is real life. I mean, it's just the stuff that goes on. You know, but stuff, the stuff that had power over me that doesn't, you know, how grateful I am, how grateful I am that I get my answers, not only from Al-Anon, but in, from good members of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I am so grateful to, uh, to AA, you know, I absolutely, you know, have nothing but admiration and love for Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, and we laugh together. And I mean, to me, that's just one of the absolute greatest gifts. But anyway, what ended up happening with Butch and I is, you know, after a few years of dating, I got pregnant. I don't care if it was a big deal for you; it was a huge deal for me. And then later on, when our life got really bad behind my husband's drinking and using, because I was sure God was punishing me. Now, mind you, I didn't believe in God. But again, information from nowhere lands here becomes fact for me because I got to blame somebody. You know, I am problem oriented. I grew up in a house. We never talk about solutions. We only talk about the problem. Who started it? Whose fault it was? Who's going to pay for it? You know, that's all I'm ever looking at is who to blame my life on. You know, and where do you lose track of everything? And let me tell you, when Butch and I got married, um, we were as sincere as any two people were that we wanted to love each other and cherish each other and do all those things that you do when, when you make your marriage vows. But what he didn't know that day and what I didn't know that day was it wasn't just Butch and Larsine that got married. It was also the family disease of alcoholism. And I'm here to tell you the family disease of alcoholism doesn't love or cherish anything or anybody. It honors no vows. It doesn't care. And the family disease of alcoholism will hurt your family, not only through the alcoholic, 
but just as equally through the family member. And I know that from my own behavior, you know, and just the crazy, crazy that just went on. And we all know what all that is and what all that looks like, you know, and I just kept throwing different things, yelling at it, screaming at it, um, you know, have more children because that's not enough. Have another baby, you know, whatever, more responsibility. Again, all this stuff I keep thinking up trying to fix someone else. And I'm getting crazier and crazier because I keep thinking that I'm throwing logic at this. You know, and I think that that's where we become sick, too. That's where things just really start to go crazy because it's a you're, you're taking an insane disease and I'm trying to put logic on it like that's going to fix it. And then I get crazy. I mean, that's just the stuff that happens. You know, this is this is the crazy alcoholic. My husband's always had trucks because he's always been in construction. He's a big loser of trucks. You know, how you lose vehicles that weigh thousands of pounds, I have no idea, but alcoholics seem to have a knack for it, okay? And so he would be home and the truck would not be there. I have no idea how he got home. And I would say to him, where's your truck? You know what an alcoholic says when you say, where's your truck? They say, what truck? Like they don't even have a truck to begin with. I mean, this is just, and then you're going down the crazy path, you know, and that's the insanity. That's the best way I know how to describe, you know, how crazy I got. And uh, somewhere in all that insanity, I went to an Al-Anon meeting, um, great meeting, great literature, but not the piece of literature I want, which is how to get, how to get them to stop drinking and do what you want them to do, because that's all I'm interested in. Yet when I was sitting in that front row of that very first meeting that I went to, and they said, Larsine, do you want your life to be different? Oh, my God, do I want my life to be different? Larsine, what are you willing to do about it? nothing because it's not my fault you fix him I'll be okay you know and again when you're functioning on that that mentality you know one more time you know everything in my life is dependent on what other people are doing and uh, and without 12 steps in the Al-Anon program you know I would never have learned that happiness is an inside job you know because there's no way the whole world is going to perform how I want them to so I can be happy for just one second in time it's just never going to be happy but when I learn to accept and love people exactly for where they are and they're doing just exactly what they're capable of doing and no more, you know, do I get that happiness? You know, that's really where it comes from. But anyway, um, Butch went on to drink another year or so after that. And he ended up getting sober. My husband got sober in, uh, in uh, 1981, um, in July of 81, arrested for drunk driving. No big deal back then, as I'm sure Dave and many of you can attest to that we're back there then, you know, you pay a lawyer 500 bucks, you're off on reckless and on it goes, you know, but this time he'd been arrested lots of times, but this time was different for him. And uh, he ended up getting sober and Alcoholics Anonymous going through a hospital program. They told me I should go to Al-Anon back then in 81. They did no family, nothing. They just said I should go. I'd already been, I knew it didn't work. But I went back to that Alano club and went to that Al-Anon meeting. I raised my hand. I said, you know, I was here a year and a half ago. I asked you how to get my husband sober and you didn't tell me. And I'm not going to tell you how I got him sober now because I was sure it was something that I had done. And you know what they said to me at that meeting? They said, keep coming back. You know, and I am here to tell you that when you're at a meeting, AA or Al-Anon, and they tell you to keep coming back, you know, it's because you are so full of BS crapola. That's your only freaking hope that they have for you until your head finally pops out of your butt and you can maybe hear something, you know, that'll help you move along the way. You know, and though we've been doing Zoom for going on almost two years now, and I've gotten used to it and I'm grateful for it. Again, you ride the horse the direction that it's going. But I tell you, I miss hearing the pop sound. I really and truly, because nothing is better to me than being in a meeting and watching somebody get it. Just, just for that moment, just that, just, it's not about everybody else. It's just about you. What are you going to do? What can you do for yourself? So much, so much. And, um, and so again, I didn't go to al -Anon. You know, what ended up happening is my husband was sober for almost two years. And, uh, and I'm here to tell you that two years into my husband's sobriety, I found myself as miserable and angry as I've ever been in my life, you know, and nobody was more shocked about that than me. You know, because I was sure when the alcoholic was sober that that would fix me. I was sure when he had a good job. I was sure when he was a good dad, a good husband, a good provider, all those things would fix me. And two years into my husband's sobriety, I'm just as angry as I've ever been. And um, and that's when I started coming to Al-Anon for reals in 1981 um, because I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. It wasn't to get an alcoholic sober or keep him sober. He was doing fine on his own. I couldn't stand myself anymore. And uh, and I am so grateful that I came into the South Bay, you know, down here in Southern California back then, you know, and 
you know, and again, my gratitude to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, my husband was sober up, you know, up until that time, I would go with him occasionally to AA meetings so I could make him sure he heard what he was supposed to hear, you know, because he's not bright and he always needs my direction. And, you know, but I remember, you know, I didn't like going to AA meetings. I just didn't like it because I was really, really worried. Don't ask me why that they would think I was an alcoholic, you know, and I would say to my husband, how are they going to know I'm not an alcoholic? And he would say, don't worry, they'll know. I thought that was complimentary. Apparently it was not. It was obvious, you know, that I was not an alcoholic. So I guess they see a lot of that. But I'm here to tell you that even at those times that I went, AA always made me feel comfortable. They never made me feel unwanted. They never made me feel like I was bad or indifferent or the evil wife or any of that. They always welcomed me. And uh, and that's what gave me the courage to be able to go to Alana because I wasn't afraid to go to a meeting because I'd been to enough AA meetings to know. And, um, you know, and, and in our group, you know, back then in 81, boy, you get a sponsor, you know, you, you work the steps, you know, and we do work the steps in al -Anon. I'm amazed sometimes that I run across people who think that we don't. It's just, an, you know, you know, I know they're hard, you know, Karen A down in Laguna, you know, one of my favorite al -Anon speakers, she always says, she always says, if you think working the 12 steps are hard, try working them when you're perfect. You know, because that's the hang up, you know, if that's for us, you know, because again, when you are justified, when you have that, you know, that justifiable anger that why this doesn't apply to you, you know, you didn't do anything, you know, it's not about whose fault it is. It's about solutions. You know, my first sponsor, Jeannie, was really big on the solution. You know, we're going to look at the solution. We're going to do this thing. You know, the same thing with finding a higher power. I did not come in here with any God. I was mad at God if even such a thing existed. And, um, and I wasn't going to do the God thing. And I was at this uh, one uh, little step study meeting that I used to go to 12, 13 people there and crazy Jean, my old friend, crazy Jean was leading that meeting. And he said, you know, everybody's going to share about God tonight because Larsine can't find a higher power. So we're all going to share with her how we found a higher power. You know, so these 12 people all shared with me their own spiritual experience. And at the end of that meeting, Jean said, Larsine, you know, you think you can find a higher power through all the sharing that was shared with you tonight? You know, and I'm like, Jean, I appreciate what people are trying to do here, but I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm not, uh, forget it. There is no God and I'm not having any part of it. And then Jean said to me, you know, Larsine, why God gave you ears. And Jean's a really little sarcastic dude if you knew him. And I just said, yeah, so I can hear what you're trying to tell me. He goes, in most people's case, that's true. But in your case, God gave you ears so you'd have something to hold on to while you pull your head out of your ass. And, um, and I'm not here to say, you know, that I've been talked too meanly in these rooms because I don't think I have. I think that was one of the most loving things that guy could have said to me. You know, because there's a big, what he went on to tell me is there's a big difference between can't and won't. You know, and it's your stubborn, you're, you're, you're this made up opinion about what you think a higher power is and that this is punishing and hurtful. You know, when all we have is Dave so well explained, you know, that we have here is just God wants you to be happy, joyous and free. That's all that the, your higher power wants you to do. The question for me all the time is what do I do to honor that? What do I do to be happy, joyous and free? You know, and, uh, and that's kind of just been the journey, you know, that I've been on just trying to find and do those things. And, you know, when things happen, good things and bad things all along the way, you know, but what's happened to me and Alan on is, you know, is I've had these 12 steps to work. I've had a sponsor, you know, I've had a, just an amazing support group, not only in Alan on, but in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I never had to do anything by myself. You know, I had a son uh, when he was 12, I came home from a meeting and he dropped acid which freaked me out, you know, because my husband's like, don't worry, you know, my husband's over at this point, you know, he's don't worry, you know, I gave him, a, you know, he's drinking milk and listening to Mozart. Apparently, that's what you're supposed to do when you drop acid. I have no idea. I didn't think that was the answer at all. So I ended up staying home with that kid all night long. And apparently having your mother in your face when you're on your very first acid trip is not a very fun trip. You know, and I'm here to tell you I've never made amends for that, and I'm never gonna, just so you know. I mean, that's just still how stubborn and pig-headed I could be about things. But I tell you, that kid gave me a rocket ride, boy. It was absolute insanity there. And uh, and I struggled in Al-Anon at this point, you know, I don't know how, nine, ten years, whatever I was in Al-Anon at that point. And it's like it all went out the window. It's, you know, I mean, I'd go to meetings. I never stopped going to meetings, but I, but I, I wasn't honest with you. I wasn't honest with how much this, this was killing me, what the struggle was, what a hard time I was having. Because again, somewhere I heard, and I know I never heard, but again, I think, I, you know, these are the things that I interpret, that if you work a good program, nothing bad will happen. 
Nobody ever said that to me, but somewhere that's what I start to figure. So if I tell you my son is out there and he's struggling, that shows you I'm not working a good program. You know, and again, one more time, I fall back into that, what you think of me and all this other type of stuff. When Al-Anon is nothing further from the truth, we don't care what's going on. We don't care any of that stuff. All we care is that you're here, you know, and that, and that you just do the best that you can with the situation that's going on. You know, and that kid was a rocket ride. And I did have a really hard time with it, you know, but I remember going when Carol was my sponsor and I asked Carol, how am I supposed to be happy, joyous and free when I have a kid who could die from this disease? And I'll never forget what she said to me because it changed literally the, the whole fiber of my life at that point. Because she says, Larsine, if you're not happy, joyous and free, then you show that kid no hope. And that's your responsibility. That's what we do here. We show each other hope because it doesn't always end up happily ever after. People go out and drink again. People die from the disease. You know, but the bottom line is that, you know, one more time, you know, I used to think, why, Carol, why do we pray for people then if then I go ahead and they die? You know, and she says, because, again, your misconception of what you think, you know, that God lets people be sober or not be sober. You know, God loves us, you know, but he doesn't take us. He just receives us. You know, and so whenever anybody dies now, I just think about God just receiving them. You know, life is, life is nothing but a big fat choice. And you've got one here. You know, there's 12 steps in a room full of people that want to love you and help you through whatever it is that but your journey is your journey you know and how grateful I am you know that you know my son you know what I ended up being able to do with him was just you know love him unconditionally Carol made me look up unconditional in the dictionary you know what it says no conditions you know and that's just exactly what that meant there was nothing that kid could do that could make me not love him but what I got to learn here too is unacceptable behavior is unacceptable you know, so when he's stealing from me and he's doing other things that I don't even have time to get into, you know, I knew it was unacceptable, you know, and I, but I got to tell him I loved him. We had to ask him to leave our home. I didn't felt like any black belt Alan on when I have to ask your home kid to leave your home. There's no black belt anything going on there. But that's what we had to do because we had a sober home. Came a day I had to tell him that he couldn't come over unless he was sober because it was too painful for me to see him when he was so loaded, so under the influence. I liken it to having your kid kidnapped but he's still right there in front of you, but it's not your kid anymore. You know how the disease affects, you know, and I remember one Thanksgiving, he came over and he stayed for all the 10 minutes and how grateful I was that Alan, on, you know, I knew what to do. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you for showing up on Thanksgiving for me. I love you very much. And you know, we're here if you need help, you know, and that kid had to do what that kid had to do. He ended up getting sober at, uh, when he was 36 years old. I'm so grateful again, one more time. I'm here to tell you, though, that kid didn't get grateful because his, or get sober because his dad's in AA or his mom's in Al-Anon. He got sober for the same reason that I think many of us are in this room today. You know, and that's just, you know, we say, but for the, uh, but for the grace of God, I believe it's but for the acceptance of God's grace. Because God's grace is available to every single person who walks the face of this planet. It's just whether or not you accept that grace in your life. You know, for me, that grace is the 12 steps, sponsorship, friends you know, and, uh, and a life beyond my wildest dreams that's come just simply because I've been willing to accept that grace. You know, I always think of the late great Howard P, you know, and it's like, you know, you're always talking about, you know, wherever you find God, wherever you find him in that moment, that window, you know, go back there as often as you can. And, you know, and to me, that's prayer and meditation and keeping that God in my life, because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the day after or whatever, and it doesn't matter. As Dave, again, so beautifully shared, you know, it's about right here, right now. And right here, right now, everything is good if I let it be. So thank you guys so much for having us tonight. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.